you know, my sort of story, really, I was more into bicycles and things, as you are in your youth, and I always liked exploring. And what we used to do, uh, my mates and myself, we, we would have two bikes. You'd have a racing bike with got handlebars and all that, and you go all belting around the roads. And then we'd do build tracker bikes. And this was back in the sort of late 60s, nine, early 70s, and it was you know, a decade before mountain bikes were even invented. You know, that, that was something of the future. But we had track, track bikes, you know, cow horn handlebars and whatever sort of vaguely sort of chunky tyres you could find. And in those days, you could go round um, what was now sort of like a, a city community site. They weren't, in those days, it was a landfill site. So you could sort of wander around those, finding old bits of bike and, and sort of bartering it between yourselves and build up a bike and that would be your tracker bike and you take it around bomb holes and old quarries and stuff like that and and then sort of other friends would have old mopeds things like sort of like um nsu quicklies and rally runabouts and 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 uh, i don't know norman nippies and all this sort of obscure stuff so these would be all pretty sort of like hacked together and probably cost them 10 bob and um We'd go and ride those places, of course, you know, then occasionally you might get chased off because you have an engine in it. But in those days, you know, you could get away with all sorts of stuff. So, you know, and I'd had a go of those and, you know, I was like, oh, no, I don't like motorbikes, dangerous and all that. Well, yeah, but this is actually fun. You don't have to pedal them, do you? Well, on a moped, you did a bit, but you had the engine as well. So, and then sort of time goes along and I'd an issue you quickly and that kept on breaking down then I bought a Suzuki 250 Hustler, which was going from like two horsepower to 33 horsepower. And had that for a couple of years, but managed to crash it once and bust my shoulder. So that put pay to that bit of motorcycling. And then in the late 70s, Dave Taylor's Trail Park opened up at Dartford. And I went up there one day, and Dave Taylor himself was there. And I said, oh, can I have a go? He, he said, yeah, but not on that, pointing to my Suzuki 500 that I had then. Uh, so I said, what you got? He said, well, got um, Yamaha DT100s and DT125s. So picked up one of those and paid me whatever it was and rode around this sort of big bomb hole up at Dartford and thought, wow, this is fun. You know, this is something different. And I think about the same time, there might have been an article in the Sunday Times about trail riding. And I thought, that looks interesting. And, and it mentioned the TRF had a contact name. So I made contact with the local group and um, you know the rest is history so i joined the trf in late 79 1980 and uh bought a kawasaki ke125 that also wasn't very reliable and went out trail riding with the trf and thought oh, this is quite good fun all these places you can explore on a motorbike didn't know you could do this and you know gradually got into it and all these little lanes that that there were and thought well this is fantastic um and then i've got an I yamaha it175 one of the sort of early enduro bikes that were, were coming in um, Kawasaki made the the, the uh, KDX 175, and there were the PE Suzukis and Honda XR uh, 200s. Um, so I bought the Yamaha, and, and that was pretty good. Used loads of petrol, but um, yeah, it was fun to ride. Um, and sort of moved on from there. And what what was the the aims of the TRF back then, I kind of know the answer to this, but it'd be good for you to kind of elaborate on that. You know, so well, well, when you it, when you joined, what was the organisation? Well, the, the the sort of the background to it was, you know, the thing is about rights of way law, and it gradually sort of came to me about the complexity of the rights of way law. And but you know, it was the reason was was because then obviously in the in the late seventies, the problem had been that in the sixty eight Countryside Act this had this test for byways and there was a suitability test and a hardship test and a did a vehicular rights away test exist and kind as i got more and more involved in it i sort of found out about the background about you know the the struggle for sort of fighting for the right to ride these green lanes on motorcycles and you know the the, the general sort of things or oh, the british public and, and authorities don't like motorbikes and um sort of put up with it a bit but you know there's we have to sort of um, support it because I realised I, I thought at the time I didn't realise there was a distinction between the competition off-road inverted commas and what the TRF was about, which was the non-competitive use of green lane, lanes or green yeah green lanes 
on motorcycles. We called them green lanes in those days. Um, we now like to call them green roads because then that emphasises that you know it's vehicular for, for motorised vehicles. But there was that that sort of oh right we've sort of thought we've sort of got to fight for this right and the way to do this is involve yourself with highway authorities and government and that's why I realised that that was sort of building this this thing that we now sort of become to know as heritage and and a heritage of green road motorcycling and then the sort of consciousness that this isn't something that was new people have been doing something like this with ACU trials clubs going right back to the early 19th century really and you know there was sort of a connectivity with the past even then um you know when you're younger you're not quite so interested in in that as as, as developed later on but then you know i carried on and bought various bikes some good some bad and uh i've always had some sort of trail bike uh to use um on on unsurfaced minor highways as i'd like to call them rather than off-road which it isn't um and you know, each time a new bit of legislation has come through, some good, some bad, generally bad, and we've then always had to sort of like try to force our way to keep what we've got. Well, back in the 70s and uh, the time that which you became aware of the TRF and you joined, was the I find it interesting that that you're still talking about kind of the the threat to the access was still as um, as prevalent back then as it is now. And I was kind of under the impression that the TRF existed to actually find lanes as much as anything. Um, well, in the, in the old days, it was a bit about that, is that you could then sort of fi- find an old road and then apply for it. But post um, the Countryside and Rights of Way Act, that is, you know, basically what we've got, we've got, we're never going to get more, we're always going to get less. Uh, and that, because of the way the sort of legislation is done, you can't, you can't say, oh, there's an old unadopted road, or oh, we discovered that, that's the old road to Canterbury or something, um, and then apply for, you know, it's a footpath, but it's obviously that it was an old road, and here's tons of evidence about that it's actually the old road doesn't matter. The legislation says, oh, I'd like this footpath. In fact, the best it can be is a restricted byway. And a restricted byway itself was a complete con because it's the same as a bridleway, but you can take horse and cart, cart along it. And whoever uses horses and carts these days, well, you know, if, if, you know, if you ask a, a, a 3,700 TRF members and ask them how many of them in the last, well, ever since they've been a member, and certainly in the last five years, I've ever met a horse and carriage on a green road, I reckon you could count those people on the fingers of one hand, the people that have actually experienced seeing a carriage on a green road in the last five years or so. So, you know, that's it. We've, what we've got is less. In those days, we could apply for more. Now, what we've got, we've got, and it's a matter of maintaining that access um, that, that we've got but you know I've, I've got some ideas for the future as well is that the, you know heritage is only important because you're preserving from the past something you can take into the future otherwise it's meaningless it becomes history and not heritage it's something that you used to be able to do but not something you can carry to the future and um you know this this is where my my job in air quality and the impact of of green vehicles uh, sort of comes comes to the forefront do you, do you think there was um so before we talk about the future just to yeah. focus on the past do you think yeah. was there a, a golden era of trail riding in, in the past 30, 30 40 years you know was <sighs> is there a point at which it's like that was great you know the the access was good the vehicles were appropriate you know yeah probably I mean, you could probably say probably the 90s, because by that time, a lot of the definitive maps had byways open to all traffic on them, but it was pre-Crow and pre-NERC, so that was established. I think we were seeing, you know, there were, there were threats on the horizon, but we didn't quite know what they were and how to fight them. Um, so probably, you know, the, it, what, what was the age of maximum access? Well, I think in the 90s, you could still ride the Ridgeway the entire length. In the 90s, you could ride lots of Somerset. 
you know, in the 90s, there's lots of parts of uh, sort of Oxfordshire and on all these counties that had roads used as public paths, you could ride them. And then under Crow, they said, ah, right, now, and, and, and Nurk, there was this business of whereby you had to put in claims. So the two have said, oh, okay, then we better hurry up and get all these claims in. And in Kent, we put a big tranche of claims in. And then the, le- the government legislator said, oh, dear, you're putting all these claims in. Oh, dear, the poor county councils won't be able to cope. Oh, we'll retrospectively date this legislation so that any claims that you've put in already aren't valid. And I've always likened it to, like, the speed limit changing. It was 50 and it's now 30 from... In fact, we're going to backdate it for the last month, and we know that you went down there last week at 50 miles an hour, but it's now retrospectively a 30 limit, so you're nicked. Three points on your licence and an £80 fine for speeding. But, you say, it wasn't... That, oh, no, we've retrospectively dated the legislation. You're guilty. So, you know, how's that right? And that's what, that's what they did with this. They retrospectively dated... Um, the claim. So, so that was something, you know, from from the the, the new millennium that's that's given us less. So, you know, there's there's plenty of places we can't ride on a petrol powered motorcycle that we're, that we're used to be able to in the past for, for reasons of duplicity, basically. Are there? Um, this is a bit of an. I'm trying to figure out the best way to frame this this question. So, uh, mm. I. I'm kind of interested in anecdotes and uh, you, you, right. you give them a, a lot of facts, which is great and really useful. Um, are there, who was your group of riding buddies back, back in the day? You know, where did you ride? And are there, right. have you got any memories well, of actually a, well, a day you, out? See, fortunately for Kent, you can still ride a lot of those places exactly the same as you could then. There's parts of the Pilgrim's Way that you can't ride anymore that were road users public path that I'd put a claim in for, but that got thrown out for various reasons. So, so there's places we can't ride, but actually in, in Kent and East, we ride, you know, in East Sussex as well, places like Crowborough and all that. A lot of the lanes that you could ride in the past, you can still ride now. So we've done okay like that and and you know the ride people have changed there, there's very few people that are still in the trf now there's one notable person is ian roscoe although his membership is, is non-continuous he joined before i joined the trf with his wife uh, or his then wife um that, that they were in the trf and uh, ian stayed in it for a while left for a few years and is now back again so there's there's people like that but lots of people have, have sort of come and gone into this but there's um in, in terms of the, you know, the hierarchy of lists of members, I'm probably about the 10th longest serving member, I think, in, in the TRF, <laughs> something like that. So when you, so when you say longest, do you, do you count as like continuous? Longest continuous. I'm certainly the longest continuous in Kent. And uh, from, the, from the list that, from the membership secretary that, that's been sent through to me, um, according to how you rank it, I was either 24th, but when you looked at the data again, it could actually be sort of lower than that. So that's 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 sort of quite quite a long a long time. So most people that that I knew uh, of you know in those days have gone on to pastures news you know, wherever. And so, but my, you know people are much the same. Motorcyclists that you know were really keen on on riding green roads, and and some people have been in you know for for many years, and occasionally people from the past pop up again and say, oh, hello, uh, you know, I, I, I'm Jeff Keyes or somebody like that. So, of course, yeah, I remember. Yeah, right, how are you and all that? And, and then they disappear again. So, so you know, there's a, sort of, there's a certain transience about it. But, um, but you know, however they change as individuals, what they do is the same as all the other people going right down through the past, through the people like Brian Thompson and before that Norman Smith, uh, and you know other people, sort of your Ralph Venables, and all those sorts of people from the past. And I sort of think we, it's almost owe it as a legacy that these long-distance reliability trial-type activities, which was how they were formalised, are, are sort of kept going as as a sort of a recreation because what was always recorded in the past tended to be the formal reliability trials. But when group of guys come let's just take the, the aj and the bees are out for a little ride around doing a bit of riding the rough roads um that tended not to be recorded that well or if it did it was very fragmented so you know i maintain that 
it's something that that people did um do you, just, you know do the um um so you're approaching retirement as you've just spoken about at length. Um, <laughs> indeed at length so um but at the period you know back in the the, the late 70s how how old would you have been when you joined the TRF? Uh, I would have been about 22 in 1979. Yeah. See, I find that interesting because the, there is a perception that the TRF is full of people that are retired or approaching retirement. But but for people like yourself, you know, when you joined, you were, you know, a young 22-year-old, you know. What, yeah. it, you know, if, 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 if young Steve was sat here, you know, what kind of <laughs> conversations would I be having with him about why he's doing what he's doing? You know, what, why, why is he interested in this? It, well, is it the same motivations as the younger guys have now? Well, I, I think at some point with what, what younger guys sometimes you do, is you get what I call fed up with rushing around in circles. You know, the, when you're younger, and it certainly was true with me when I was younger, and I did enduros, and that was the thing that, you know, trail riders sort of ostensibly aspired to. And, of course, so you entered an enduro, and you rushed round and round, and you fell off your bike, and, you know, you got puffed out there, oh, for crying out loud, you know, I've got to keep up the pace here, you know. And, and you're sort of whizzing around and, and sort of racing each other. And then it's sort of the realisations coming. Well, actually, it's quite a nice countryside around this. It's fun riding. Why do I have to go so fast? Why can't I just stop? And then I started doing marshalling occasionally on enduros as well. And actually, that was more fun. And watching other people rushing around. Okay, they might have been, you know, sort of getting the adrenaline gland, adrenal glands going. But I was there going, oh, this is a nice bit of countryside. And, it, and it's that sort of thing that appeals to me. And, and one of the, going back to the, the, the dislike of London is that one of the advantages of working in London, it makes you appreciate not being there. Uh, you know, any big city, I, I feel that is, is a, you know, it, London is, is a great city to escape from. And, and, and London will always, you know, for, until my dying day, will, will form part of my psyche because, it's, you know, it's not that I pathologically hate it in its entirety. London is good in parts, like the curate's egg. But London as a whole, as my dad said, is a whole, um, like all big cities. Um, you know, I contrast that with places like in the old parts of York and Wells in Somerset. But um, and, and so motorcycling for me is that it, it represents escape. And so trail riding is an extrapolation of motorcycling because you can go and ride your motorbike in places where they tend not to be other people much. If you go you know, you've, you've got a fast sports bike, I've got a ZX9, a ZX6, lots of places around here, you go for a ride, you're just going along in queues of other traffic, you're getting in the way, you can't, you know, have a nice ride round the twisty lane, well, you can ride round twisty lanes, but, you know, on the main road, it's just chock-a-block. Um, and so I think a lot of people want, you know, to get faster and faster road, sports road bikes, and suddenly they, they recalibrate. So I don't think it'll ever be something that... The young Steve, you know, I was probably quite young. A lot of people tended to be older than me. I thought, you know, people probably in their 30s and older. And I think by its nature, trail riding would always attract the slightly older member. But, you know, almost it's the thing you have to put in the mindset of the younger ones. And you get fed up with rushing around in circles and you realise, actually, I want to appreciate the beauty of the countryside and nature and all this sort of stuff. Come out with us. And you know, if if you in, see if you enjoy it, um, you know it's it's not an it's not an end in itself. It's sometimes a means to an end, motorcycling uh, and and places you can go as well. Um, in fact, in sort of digressing again, but you know one of the interesting things I do connecting up with my other hobbies, the the, the living history and the in the world wars, is to go riding in France. And a motorcycle is absolutely the ideal way, an even better way of doing it is to go around the old battlefields on a motorbike and we did Normandy so we did Normandy 1944 a few years back and we went to various places in northern France on our trail bikes and trail riding in northern France is at the moment as far as I you know, still believe and, our, and other friends in the TR have also done that as well so you know the, the trail riding becomes a means to an end not just an end in itself although it can be a means to an end and an end in itself okay um, and then kind of skipping forwards you were mm. talking about this idea of heritage 
and heritage being the ability to take something that has been done in the past and continue doing it in the future. So yes. what, what are your ideas? Where is trail riding going? In, in that, I mean, that's a good question. I mean, everybody always talks about the environment and pollution um, and, you know, all these sorts of uh, green initiatives and all that. And, and certainly in my area, professionally, which is with air quality and cities and being in Westminster in central London, it's the, you know, the highest pollution from traffic pollution there is, uh, particularly places like Oxford Street. There's, you know, big initiatives on electric vehicles and hybrids. Motorcycles themselves are a little bit behind on that. There are electric motorcycles. But they haven't had the sort of uptake. You think cars like the Toyota Prius um, and the, the various Lexus, Lexus cars and uh, what else? You know, Audi e-tron series of cars. Um, yeah. So you know, sort of professionally, when I go to these conferences, these air pollution conferences, particularly about sort of green vehicles, you know, have electric vans and electric lorries and gas-powered this and whatever. And right, okay, any questions? I stand up. Where are the electric motorcycles? Ah, yeah, mm, yeah, good point. Uh, yeah, well, right, uh, yeah, sometimes people say, oh, well, I'm a motorcyclist, but yeah, um, there aren't that many at the moment. Mm, yeah, it's something we need to work on, sort of thing. And one of my favorite ones I've ridden are from California, the Zero motorcycles, and the one that I'll probably will be my next motorcycle, the Yamaha 450 and probably my 600 Kawasaki will go at some point. Uh, and hopefully with some of my pension money, I'm thinking of buying a Zero DS, which is pure electric. Um, and, uh, so as long as I'm, I'm going to borrow one and see how far they go, because allegedly they're supposed to do over 100 miles. Now, when you go trail riding, very rarely do you do more than 100 miles at a time. So I think there's a future, and I believe that TRF, you know, as a director, I'm trying to sort of push this past, present future thing if we want to do what we've done in the past that we're doing now and carry on into the future we need to rethink our game you think of the pressure on the the national parks now what is the problem with trail riding well pretty much there are three issues the main one is noise and that is whatever people say uh, about motorcycles they're too noisy and they'll always be too noisy. But if you've got an electric motorcycle, although they're not actually silent, they are effectively silent. The, you know, the noise level of them, they're inaudible at more than something like 10 meters. Um, and when they're working, they're only making a whirring noise anyway. So, and also there's no gaseous pollutants emitted from them at point of use. You can argue that the factory that makes it, power station makes electricity is making pollution, then you can say, well, actually, I procure my electricity from a solar panel or wind or something. So, you know, there's ways of arguing around that. So on that green credential, um, I think the TRF needs to adopt some sort of philosophy about that and, and ideas around, OK, TROs don't apply to electric motorcycles and also restricted byways are open to electric motorcycles that sort of thing, and that's a sort of a positive initiative. If you want to carry on riding, okay, there are a few rules. You know, that KTM 450 you've got with that nice big motocross pipe on it, no way, it's not welcome. That Zero DS, happy days, off you go. So, you know, the, uh, it has been said to me, well, I've got four petrol bikes, what am I going to do? Well, sell two of them and buy an electric bike is my retort to that. Um, whether or not the TRF membership will like being told that, I don't know. But if we want to carry on riding into the future in sensitive areas, I think we've got to put something positive forwards. Otherwise, we won't be able to use anything um, other than my electric mountain bikes, which is another story. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I guess it's about saying what is... Yeah, I mean, the what is the future it doesn't have to be what yeah. what, what the past has been but um no well, that, that's but, it exactly but, but is it is it fair to say that is it fair to the heritage and is it true to the heritage of trail riding that the future is electric and we have to forget about petrol you know because surely that is maybe that's too far from yeah from well that, we that that's a very good point isn't it is is you know you can't completely throw that out because you go well hang about what do we do with all these ajs's and bsa's and whatever uh you know what are they going to just sit in a museum all the time or are we going to you know allow them to be used i mean the strange paradox is in london with all the uh emission zone stuff if you've got a historic vehicle 
um, they're not included in in all the sort of emission controls of, of either the ultra low emission zone from 2020 or from the current London low emission zone that covers basically the greater London area. Um, historic vehicles are still permitted, so it's anything before about 1972 is okay. So the strange thing is, is that of all my motorbikes, the only one I'll be able to use in the ultra low emission zone from 2020 is my 1955 AJS. My 2004 Kawasaki, my 1999 Kawasaki, and my two, early 2007 Yamaha won't be allowed in the ultra low emission zone in central London unless I pay twelve pounds fifty. It's like the more <laughs> you have, the more polluting you are, then the more chance you are getting to use. Yeah, it. well, this, this is this is a paradox. I mean, there aren't very many, but you know, this, yes, it's the important thing to actually preserve the right of of you know using our bikes in places. Uh, for the for the future, and but you know what I think we have to do is to accept there may be more restrictions on the traditional methods than the new methods. You know why is it that that bicycles are so, you know seem to be okay, whereas motorcycles are not seem to be okay? Now, is it the other two things, surface erosion and danger? Now, as well as noise, surface erosion and danger are the challenges. Now, people sometimes rope us in with four wheel drives. And I've got fairly strong anti-feelings on four-wheel drives use on green roads because unlike the original light cars of heritage that used green roads like the Baby Austins and the Trials cars and stuff like that that weren't very heavy, a modern four-wheel drive weighs sort of two to three tonnes, has a two or three hundred horsepower engine, big heavy tyres, and basically they rip their way through the countryside. Whereas a motorcycle, a modern motorcycle is probably not much difference in weight to an old one. Okay, they might be a bit lighter and slightly more powerful, but not much in it. Conceptually, they're not hugely different, where there's modern four-wheel drives in use in the countryside. So the surface damage thing about motorcycles, I say, come on, be realistic. The amount of surface wear, I wouldn't even use the word damage, but the amount of surface wear caused by a motorcycle on a green road is less than and probably certainly not even equal to that of a horse. It's going to be more than a bicycle and probably more than a, a, than a trampler or a walker, but if a country surface can't stand up to the weight of a motorcycle and its rider weighing all in 400 pounds or so, well, something's wrong there, uh, and maybe they need to you know, put a decent surface on it or sort of do what the Romans did and have drainage ditches on either side. So, you know, so that's that. I, th I think the, the surface erosion thing for motorcycles is something we need to push away. And the problem is by being seen in the same camp as the four-wheel drive lobby and fighting for the same rights, that we tend to be tarred with the same brush. And we gain very little by that liaison I believe and that's that's a personal belief some people would support me on that and other people who also own four wheel drives and, and use them on green roads will be object and go oh no we're all we're all motorists whereas as I say no we're not we've got more to do with cyclists and mountain bikers well the mountain bikers tend not to care about rights away at all but conceptually a motorcycle is more like a bicycle than it is a four wheel drive car so, you know, that's my feelings on that. And the TRF needs, I believe, to, to look to the past and say, well, is there something that we need to connect from the past, an alliance with four-wheel drive for the future? Or should we say they're a separate user group, they make their own arguments? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So that's that. And the third thing is the safety thing and, and you know, the, the inverted commas danger. And I think, fortunately, they're relatively few incidents between trail riders and other green road users um and you know you try to get an accident statistics on on green roads and they tend not to exist you know you seem to have sort of tending towards not necessarily zero but very very few if people do get hurt it's the riders ourselves you know we're the ones that get hurt by by falling off our bikes so you know if there yes there is a danger but that's part of the thrill of of what done you know you hope you don't hurt yourself too much but we all fall off and hopefully you, you know you just laugh and uh, pick yourself up and swear a bit and and off you go but um so so you know they're the three aspects the the three challenges but i think the main one is noise uh and brackets pollution and i think we you know so we can do what we did in the past into the future we need to acknowledge 
that if the only you know if the concession is electric is the way forwards, we'll we'll maintain what we can from the past, but you know we need to make some value judgments about about how we see where we're going for the future. Because certainly in the national parks, in one of your previous interviews, I saw that you know it, it, um, you can sort of hype it up as you know it's all wonderful and all that whereas the interpretation could be actually in the national parks we're not doing very well particularly in the peak district where there's tro's going up left right and center or yeah. everything's being reclassified into a bridal way and almost there's nowhere to go anymore yeah 